so maybe I'll get started. Uh, so hello everyone, thanks for, for calling in. My name is Rachel Berta and I'm one of the CCFP EM residents. Um, today I'll be presenting on transfusion reactions in the emergency department. I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Amit Shah, for his advice and feedback. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Ziad Sol, as well as Dr. Ian Chinyi, who are both hematologists here at LHSC. Uh, Dr. Sol reviewed my slides for me, and Dr. Chinyi is here in the talk today, um, and we'll be able to address some questions at the end. I'd also like to thank Donna Berta, who is the previous transfusion safety officer at LHSC, for her advice uh, and feedback on this topic. So the objectives of my presentation are to explain the following take-home points using two cases of transfusion reactions in the ED. And at the end of the presentation, I'll discuss reaction reporting uh, more in depth. So by the end of the presentation, I hope that you will know to prevent TACO by treating at-risk patients with Lasix, giving one unit at a time, and giving it slowly over three and a half hours. Next, I hope you'll know to monitor trolley patients closely because they're likely to deteriorate. Third, I hope to explain for you to treat serious febrile transfusion reactions as bacterial sepsis until proven otherwise, and investigate for both bacterial sepsis and hemolysis concurrently. Next, I hope you'll be able to use free open access resources to manage transfusion reactions. And lastly, uh, I'll explain why it's important to report all reactions to the blood bank. For the first case, you have a 76-year-old female in the eMERGE with new anemia and history of chronic kidney disease. Her hemoglobin is 56 and she is receiving two units of PAC cells in the eMERGE. She develops dyspnea and tachycardia. Here the monitor shows her heart rate is right around 100, her oxygen saturation is low at 93, and her rest rate is high at 22. In this presentation, what is your differential diagnosis? For transfusion-associated dyspnea, your differential diagnosis should include transfusion-associated circulatory overload, or TACO for short, transfusion-related acute lung injury, or trolley for short, and anaphylaxis, as well as other non-transfusion-related causes of dyspnea. So in the presentation, I'm going to focus on TACO and trolley because the management of anaphylaxis is really no different from our usual anaphylaxis that we see in the eMERGE. So this is your patient's chest x-ray. It shows some signs of pulmonary edema, which makes a, a diagnosis of TACO more likely. To delve into the pathophysiology of TACO briefly, the blood product transfusion causes an increase in hydrostatic pressure, resulting in a transudative pulmonary edema. And this is not necessarily proportional to the volume of blood product that's administered. In fact, the mean volume at which patients develop symptoms is only 300 cc's. TACO, TACO often presents with the signs and symptoms uh, listed here, dyspnea, hypertension, tachycardia, orthopnea, and increased JVP, or in general, signs of heart failure. Um, early in the disease course, these patients are hypertensive usually, compared to trolley where patients are usually hypotensive. Um, TACO is important because it's a very common transfusion reaction. Um, the estimated incidence is one in 100 red cell transfusions. It's also important because it's the leading cause of transfusion-related mortality. So this is the official definition of TACO. It was uh, revised recently. Essentially, it requires objective findings of acute heart failure within 12 hours of a blood transfusion. The most important thing you can do to prevent TACO is to identify risk factors uh, before you order the transfusion. So these risk factors include extremes of age, um, uh, severe euvolemic anemia with a hemoglobin less than 50, history of heart disease or CHF, renal dysfunction, and positive fluid balance. 
In patients who have multiple risk factors for TACO, they should be pre-medicated with Lasix before the transfusion. Other steps you can take to prevent TACO include ordering only one unit of blood at a time and rechecking their hemoglobin after that unit. Uh, you should also transfuse the unit slowly over three and a half hours. Note that four hours is the maximum time that uh, blood can be outside the temperature controlled environment of the blood bank. So the maximum time, uh, giving some time for transport is three and a half hours. So I know that giving blood slowly over three and a half hours might affect the ED flow. Um, so I looked for some evidence to support this recommendation. This chart is from a 2011 case control study of 51 cases of TACO in the ICU. So not necessarily applicable to our patients, but uh, they compared the TACO cases with matched controls who were transfused but did not develop TACO. They found that the TACO cases had significantly faster rate of transfusion at 205, or sorry, 225 cc's per hour compared to the controls who were transfused at 168 cc's per hour. They also found that the TACO cases were more likely to have received more units than the controls at three versus two. So while this is not RCT evidence, um, it does support using uh, one unit at a time approach and uh, slowing down the transfusion if possible. I also looked into some evidence around pre-medicating at-risk patients with Lasix, and I found that there are also no RCTs um, to, uh, to support this, although there are some observational studies. So this chart is from a 1983 non-randomized trial of 20 patients who had chronic anemia and were receiving a blood transfusion. So the pulmonary artery wedge pressure was measured before and after transfusion of one unit of red cells. And the intervention was that half of the patients received Lasix. Following transfusion, the wedge pressure increased significantly in the non-Lasix group, group one, and it decreased significantly in the group who had received 40 milligrams of IV Lasix. So this supports the use of Lasix to prevent TACO, but it uses a surrogate outcome measure. A 2015 Cochrane systematic review included four studies that involved 100 participants. Two additional studies showed improvement in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with Lasix pretreatment. And there was another study that showed improvement in the FiO2 with Lasix pretreatment. So the authors of this review noted that, again, these are surrogate outcomes, and none of these studies used an endpoint of TACO development. Um, so they conclude that there's insufficient evidence to recommend pretreatment with Lasix, and that well-conducted RCTs are needed. However, this practice of pretreating with Lasix in high-risk patients is still widely recommended by hematologists and uh, multiple societies. So um, despite the limited evidence, you should still consider it in patients who have risk factors, which I've uh, put up here to remind you. So moving along from prevention of TACO to treatment of TACO, if it does develop, the first step is to stop the transfusion. You should administer supplemental oxygen as needed and give the patient a dose of IV Lasix. You could consider restarting the transfusion more slowly if the patient is actively bleeding or if they stabilize with these measures. And the last management in TACO, the last step in management is to report the reaction to the blood bank. So back to the beginning of our case, uh, what if the chest X-ray had looked like this? So this X-ray shows more diffuse pulmonary infiltrates similar to ARDS rather than the classic findings of CHF. This X-ray looks more like transfusion-related acute lung injury or trolley. The etiology of trolley is uh, poorly understood. Uh, it's a rare reaction, but it's a very serious one. The estimated rate is one in 5,000 plasma containing products, but the mortality is high at anywhere from five to 20%. One theory of the underlying pathophysiology is the two hit hypothesis. So the first hit is neutrophil priming, 
from an underlying condition which predisposes the patient to inflammation. And this could be sepsis, trauma, et cetera. And the second hit is um, neutrophil activation by anti-leukocyte antibodies or biologically active lipids in the blood product. And these activated neutrophils um, cause capillary leakage and pulmonary edema. So note that this pathophysiology is different from TACO, where the pulmonary edema is caused by increased hydrostatic pressure. This is more of a generalized systemic inflammatory response. Uh, and because of that, these patients are more likely to present with hypotension, whereas patients with TACO are more likely to present with hypertension. So there's also a new definition of tro trolley uh, recently published, and it's um, up to date with the newest Berlin ARDS definitions. So the criteria for trolley include objective signs of acute lung injury within six hours of the transfusion, and there must be no evidence of heart failure um, and no other ARDS risk factors. Historically, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure was used in this definition, but since PA catheters are no longer uh, used very often, um, the, the defining group recommends getting an echo to show no signs of heart failure. Uh, checking to see if there are signs of fluid overload could potentially be a use of POCUS in the ED, but this has not been specifically studied in trolley. The first step of management of trolley is to stop the transfusion and do not restart that unit. If the patient is actively bleeding and needs more blood, a different unit could be given, presumably because it would not have the same antibodies as the unit that caused trolley. You should start supplemental oxygen and escalating ventilatory support as needed. Um, steroids and diuretic, diuretics have not been shown to be helpful in trolley. Um, these patients require co close monitoring because uh, the vast majority will require mechanical ventilation. There's a series of 36 patients in a, a, a case series, and all these patients required oxygen and 72% required mechanical ventilation. The last step in management is to call the blood bank to report this reaction. If you think that the patient has trolley, this is a serious reaction and you should call the hematologist because they can order specific antibody testing on the donor and the recipient to help diagnose trolley. As a result of reaction reporting and large database analysis, um, associations were made with trolley and donations from females who have had pregnancies in the past. Since then, steps have been taken to reduce the risk of trolley. These include excluding females who are ever pregnant from donating blood, or sorry, from donating plasma products. Uh, it also includes deferring donors who have uh, been involved in a case of trolley. These measures have led to a decreased incidence of trolley, which has been shown in multiple blood systems worldwide. So this figure is from a UK report uh, in 2017 that showed a reduction in the number of cases of trolley after female plasma donations were excluded back in 2004. And this 2019 study from New York State showed a decrease in the rate of trolley from three per 100,000 to 0.5 per 100,000 uh, with similar mitigation measures. Note that the biggest effect was, again, from using male predominant plasma donations, which is marked with the first asterisk here. It can be difficult to distinguish TACO versus trolley, especially early in the disease course. So in the emergency department, you can kick the can for diagnosis to the blood bank and focus on empiric treatment of the patient in front of you. Essentially, you should support the patient's breathing as you would any other patient with respiratory failure. If your patient is hemodynamically stable and you think it's more likely TACO, you could try a dose of Lasix to see if there's a response and this would support your diagnosis. But if you're just not sure if it's TACO or trolley or something else, um, it's a safe bet to get the blood bank involved early um, so that they can help with the workup of this patient. So the take home points for transfusion related dyspnea are first to prevent TACO by pre-treating at risk patients with Lasix, giving one unit of blood at a time and giving it slowly over three and a half hours. 
Second, monitor potential trolley patients very closely because they are likely to deteriorate. And third, always report post-transfusion dyspnea to the blood bank. The second case is a 77-year-old man who presented to the eMERGE with a hip fracture and he's awaiting an ortho OR. He was found to be thrombocytopenic and he's receiving a unit of platelets. While he's still in the ED waiting to go up to the OR, he develops a fever and hypotension. So in this case, what is your differential diagnosis? So the differential diagnosis of uh, febrile transfusion reaction should include bacterial sepsis, acute hemolytic reaction, and a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, among other non-transfusion related causes. So when assessing a patient with a febrile transfusion reaction, or really any reaction, it's important to determine if there are any serious signs or symptoms. These include as listed here in the middle, dyspnea, chest pain, hemoglobinuria, nausea or vomiting, temperature greater than 39 degrees, hypotension, tachycardia, rigors, or bleeding from IV sites. If any of these are present, you must consider serious pathology, including bacterial contamination and a hemolytic transfusion reaction. If there are no serious signs or symptoms and your patient appears well, aside from the fever, the most likely cause is a febrile non-hemolytic reaction. So now I'll go into detail uh, um, all of these reactions. So first, bacterial contamination causing sepsis is a serious reaction. It accounts for 10% of transfusion associated fatalities. It is much more common than any other bloodborne transmissible disease, such as HIV or hepatitis, on the order of 100 times more common than either of these. Blood may be contaminated by skin bacteria from the donor, unrecognized bacteremia in the donor, or contamination from the environment or handling of the product. Platelets, shown here in the photo, are the blood product at the highest risk of contamination because they're stored at room temperature, allowing for more rapid growth of bacteria. The management of bacterial sepsis after transfusion is intuitive, with stopping the transfusion or controlling the source of infection as the first step. After this, you should start broad-spectrum antibiotics. The most common bacteria are gram-positive, such as Staph aureus, but about one-third of cases have gram-negative bacteria, so that's the reason why uh, broad-spectrum antibiotics are recommended. It's important to send the unit of blood, as well as the tubing, back to the blood bank so it can be cultured. You should also draw blood cultures from the patient from a different IV site. The last step is reporting the reaction to the blood bank. This is another serious reaction where you should call the hematologist on call to report the reaction. Back to our case of transfusion associated fever, you notice that the patient has what looks like gross hematuria. This is actually hemoglobinuria, a sign of possible hemolysis. Acute hemolytic transfusion reactions can be caused by ABO incompatibility, non-ABO alloantibodies, as well as non-immune hemolysis. The non-immune hemolysis happens when there's a thermal or mechanical injury, usually from heating, um, contact with ice during transport, or pressurized infusers. And today I'll focus on the first two causes. So first, for ABO incompatibility, we're all familiar with the four major blood groups uh, depicted here. Incompatibility happens when the recipient has antibodies to the donor red cell antigens. The antibodies attach to the donor red cells, causing agglutination or clumping of the cells, which are then lysed as they pass through the spleen. The hemolysis releases intracellular cytokines, leading to a systemic inflammatory response causing symptoms of fever, hypotension, and dyspnea. In addition, the free hemoglobin in the bloodstream is uh, toxic to the kidneys and can cause acute tubular necrosis and renal failure, as well as hemoglobinuria. DIC with mixed bleeding and thrombosis can also develop from hemolysis. 
ADL incompatibility is extremely rare, but a very serious and potentially fatal reaction. The incidence is estimated at one in 38,000 red cell transfusions. And most errors are caused by a clerical error or administering properly labeled blood to the wrong patient. Non-ABO group alloantibodies can also cause hemolysis, although these reactions are much less severe and more likely to be delayed. In order for a patient to develop alloantibodies, they must have been to exposed to a minor RBC antigen, such as one of those depicted on the red cell here. This exposure could have happened in pregnancy or from a previous transfusion. When you send a group and screen, the antibody screen part is looking for antibodies to these antigens. The screen takes about 45 minutes to do. Uncross-matched blood is given without a patient antibody screen, and this is risky for hemolysis. The rate of hemolysis in patients receiving uncross-matched blood is higher than, uh, than ABO incompatibility at about 1 in 2,000. And it should only be given when you can't wait the 45 minutes for the antibody screen because the patient is bleeding and unstable. If you suspect hemolysis, you should stop the transfusion and do not restart that unit. Check for the most common cause of ABO incompatibility, namely a clerical error. You should send the unit back to the blood bank so the ABO group can be rechecked, and you should order a repeat group and screen on your patient. You should also order a hemolytic workup, including those blood tests listed here. You should send the first post-transfusion urine sample for a urinalysis to detect hemoglobinuria, which would support a diagnosis of hemolysis. And the last step is to report the reaction. This is another serious reaction where you should um, consult hematology with a phone call. If your workup for hemolysis is positive and the patient is still in the ER, you should try to prevent kidney injury by uh, giving the patient IV fluids. You can also check for hyperkalemia secondary to red cell lysis, and you should consult hematology for further management. If the workup for hemolysis is negative, you should treat with broad spectrum antibiotics um, because it could be bacterial sepsis. And early in the disease course, as I mentioned, it may be impossible to distinguish between these two. So back to our case, what if this patient had a post-transfusion fever with no serious signs or symptoms? So this patient likely has a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. These reactions are common, especially in RBCs and platelet transfusions. The definition is a fever during or within four hours of transfusion. And there must be no serious signs or symptoms such as those in the red box. There are two proposed mechanisms of febrile non-hemolytic reactions. First, Cytokines from donor white blood cells are released during product storage and cause a minor systemic inflammatory reaction in the recipient. Another possible cause is uh, donor white blood cells, uh, or sorry, recipient antibodies to the donor white blood cells. Now, in most products, there should not be many white blood cells because there's universal leukoreduction or filtering out of the white cells. However, despite this, some will inevitably remain and could cause a febrile non-hemolytic reaction. So in management of non-hemolytic reactions, um, the first step, as in all other reactions, is to stop the transfusion. Uh, you should go and assess the patient and double check that there are no signs or symptoms of a serious febrile reaction. The medical treatment is with Tylenol. Um, there is no evidence for pre-medication with Tylenol and Benadryl, and this has been studied in RCTs. If the fever resolves and the patient appears well with no serious signs or symptoms, it's safe to restart the transfusion. You should still report these reactions to the blood bank, even though they're not serious ones. So the bottom line for febrile transfusion reactions are to first determine if there are serious signs or symptoms, 
And next, if there are serious signs or symptoms, treat with broad spectrum antibiotics. In addition, you should investigate for both bacterial sepsis and hemolysis at the same time. Lastly, report all febrile reactions to the blood bank, even febrile non-hemolytic reactions. There are a number of free open access resources for transfusion management reaction. Sorry, transfusion reaction management. Um, the Bloody Easy 4 manual shown here in the middle is created by the Ontario Regional Blood Coordinating Network. It's updated regularly and can be found online with a quick Google search. There's also an LHSC specific resource um, called the Track, and it can be found on the LHSC internet under manuals and guides. It's organized by symptom and displays charts with stepwise approach to investigating, treating, and reporting reactions. Another great resource is your hospital's blood bank. There's always a hematologist on call for transfusion medicine, and they are available to answer questions and provide guidance on serious reactions. In addition, the medical lab technologists at the blood bank are specifically trained beyond regular lab technologists. They're trained to receive the reports from reactions. So if you have questions about how to make a report or what to send back to the blood bank, you can call them up and ask. I've mentioned reporting a few times now. So I would like to spend the last part of the presentation talking about the importance of reporting and how to do so at LHSC. So the purpose of reporting is to prevent further reactions from occurring in two ways. The first way is removal of companion products. As you know, whole blood from one donor is centrifuged and made into multiple blood products, RBCs, platelets, and plasma, among other products. If there's a serious reaction to one blood product, and you, um, sorry, if there's a serious reaction to one blood product, reporting can ensure that the companion products are removed. This is important because uh, different products have different shelf lives. RBCs are kept for 42 days, platelets are kept for five days, and plasma is kept at the blood bank for up to a year. So if your patient has a serious reaction to platelets, say, and you don't make a report, a companion product could be sitting on the shelf for weeks to months, just waiting to make another patient sick. Another way that reaction reporting can help is to mitigate future reactions. By tracking reactions, Provincial, national, and international hemovigilance databases can find new associations to make blood transfusions more safe. An example of this working well is the exclusion of plasma donations from females, uh, which has reduced the incidence of Charlie, as I discussed earlier. In addition to these reasons, there's a new law that came into effect uh, in December of 2019 that mandates hospitals to report all serious adverse drug reactions and medical device incidents to Health Canada for tracking. And this includes transfusion reactions. So to give some Ontario data, for the time frame of 2014 to 2018, there were 2.5 million blood product transfusions in Ontario. And there were over a thousand transfusion reactions in that time frame. Each of these reactions is investigated by the hospital's blood bank and then assigned a grade based on severity. As you can see from the chart, just over half of the reactions were either severe or life-threatening. So this chart shows um, LHSC transfusion reaction data from the 2019 annual report. There were 250 transfusion reactions reported at LHSC in 2019 out of over 32,000 dispensed blood products, and that only includes RBCs, platelets, and plasma. The chart here shows the location from which the reactions were reported. Note that only 1% of reactions were reported from the ED. The full report showed that 10% of blood products were dispensed to the ED. This means that there's probably some underreporting of reactions. So how do you actually make a report? It turns out to be pretty easy. You just go onto FirstNet and start by entering a new order. You search for transfusion reaction and the care set TRX will show up. After you complete the, the care set, you hit sign 
and a report sheet will print out similar to when you order a prescription. The report sheet should be completed and faxed to the blood bank. This is what the printed report sheet looks like. At the top, you can complete the vital signs or ask your nursing colleague to assist with this and then fax the report to the blood bank. This is what the bottom of the report shows. There are check boxes where you can quickly and easily complete uh, the patient's symptoms, investigations that you've done in the eMERGE, as well as treatments. And this helps the blood bank with their investigation of the reaction. As I mentioned before, the hospital blood bank and transfusion medicine service are resources that are available to us in the ER. There's always a hematologist on call for transfusion medicine, and they're available to answer questions and provide guidance on serious reactions. At LHSC, Dr. Ziad Sol is the main transfusion hematologist, and he and his team investigate every single reaction that's reported. At LHSC and most other tertiary hospitals, there's also a transfusion safety officer who's an RN or technologist who specialized in education around transfusion safety, as well as investigating reactions. Remember that after hours, there are medical lab technologists at the blood bank who are available to answer questions about how to make a report and what to send back to the blood bank. So just call them up and ask if you're not sure. In the ER on a good day, our plates are full. By this, I mean that we're busy with competing priorities, uh, lots of patient data in our head, and we're generally cognitively overloaded. So it may seem like adding more to our already full plates to ask you to print and fax a report to the blood bank. But I hope that I've convinced you that there are a number of good reasons to do so, both for the patient in front of you, as well as for potential recipients of companion products. Remember that blood products are supposed to be therapeutic and it's all of our responsibility to mitigate inevitable, inevitable adverse reactions. So before I open up for questions, uh, I'd like to review my take home points one more time. So first, prevent TACO by pre-treating at-risk patients with Lasix, giving one unit at a time and giving it slowly over three and a half hours. Next, monitor trolley patients closely because they're likely to deteriorate. Next, treat serious febrile reactions as bacterial sepsis until proven otherwise, and investigate for both sepsis and hemolysis concurrently. Next, use free open access resources, such as Bloody Easy 4 and the blood bank to manage transfusion reactions. Next, report all potential transfusion reactions to the blood bank. So thank you everyone for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions now. And I didn't look to see if Dr. Chinyi is on the call. He's one of the hematologists who covers transfusion at LHSC. Just looking through. Right. Hey, Rachel, I think you did a really great job on this. Um, now, I, I think on the whole, most of these reactions are pretty uncommon, as, as you said at the beginning. And I don't think I've seen anything other than a little bit of a mild febrile response. But it's really great to just have this, this nice solid refresher with some new evidence-based um, in order to have a good approach to it if we do see it. So I really appreciate your uh, putting this together for rounds. Hi, Rachel. I had a question. Uh, uh, I wondered if you and Dr. Chin Yi might be able to comment a bit on um, how often we deal with uh, more complex uh, transfusion reactions and any anecdotal experiences of things that have gone well or things we could do differently in eMERGE, maybe from your experience or Dr. Chin Yi's experience. That, uh, and thanks for doing this. Yeah. Thank you. 
So the only reactions I've experienced um, are similarly minor ones. I've seen one case of probable taco. Um, and again, it was treating the taco after it had developed. So I think the main thing is to think about preventing it before ordering the transfusion. And then the other main point is just uh, what I learned from this is that reporting is really appropriate in any reaction. I don't know if Dr. Chinyi or anyone else has any other experiences with uh, the more severe reactions. We clearly have a very pristine blood supply in London. That's uh... So I think maybe we'll just wait another minute or two if there are no other questions. Okay, I think it sounds like there are no other questions. So um, thanks everyone for, for calling in and for your attention. Um, I guess we'll, we'll end it there unless anyone has any other comments or, or questions. Feel free to email. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks everyone.